Good afternoon. I'm Stefan Yost, the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And today I'm joined by our curator of modern art, Kenneth Brummel, and he will be giving a presentation to the members of the Curator Circle um, about Henry Moore and his impact on Toronto. We like to begin these events by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga of the New Credit, as well as the Huron-Wendat and Neutral Nations through time. We're actually at a pretty exciting moment with the AGO because we're actually considering how to reopen. And I want everybody to know that the AGO staff has really worked hard and we're ready to go once we get the green light. Um, we're hoping in a couple, several weeks, once, once the government says we can go ahead, we don't have a fixed date yet. But we did talk to people and we talked to you all and membership and we know what people want. So the first thing you should be able to expect when we reopen is we're gonna be open to members and to annual pass holders first. Um, we've heard that the visitors want to have everybody wear masks and our staff wear masks, so that's easy to accommodate. Um, there will be physical distancing, which everybody knows what that is now. And finally, um, we're going to do time ticketing so we can make sure that there's a safe number of people in Toronto in the AGO. Um, it's pretty exciting to me and our staff is thrilled for the most part that we're going to reopen and welcome people back. Art needs people. Um, but during this time, AGOCA has been really um, uh, dynamic. The website has and um, Kenneth um, is going to be talking today again about Henry Moore and his impact on Toronto. If you have questions, you should just feel free to put them in the Q&A and they'll be channeled to us. And at the end, if we have time, we can take a couple questions. We hope today's presentation will be about 35, 40 minutes. Um, so we, we, um, we hope you grab a drink and um, engage in this talk. So without further ado, Kenneth, why don't you take us away? Thank you so much, Stefan. And I want to thank everyone who is a member of the Curator Circle and AGO Next. Thank you for joining us. And it's a pleasure to discuss Toronto's history of public sculpture with all of you and our very special relationship with the British sculptor, Henry Moore. Um, and so here we will begin our lecture and um, we just stopped our video. And I want to begin this lecture with this photograph of Henry Moore taken in March 1967 in front of the Archer, which all of you know is in Nathan Phillips Square. And um, this photograph for me, it really encapsulates what this lecture is about, which is about how the generosity of one artist transformed not just the civic culture of a city, but also an artistic culture. But as um, many of these stories are, it is an extremely complicated story and it's a story about really perseverance and a belief in a vision and a belief in implementing that vision and mobilizing all of the people required in order to see that vision realized. So let us begin with 1958. This is a photograph of Vilho Revel. He is a Finnish architect and he is the one who won the 1958 International Architectural Commission for the design of the new city hall and the Civic Square in downtown Toronto. His vision was to create a lyrical counterpoint to the Toronto Dominion Center, but he also wanted Nathan Phillips Square to be almost a forum, a place where people would gather. And you can see in the photograph of the um, city hall how the two curves, the two arcs, how they are an architectural counterpoint to the rigid rectilinear grid of the Mies van der Rohe designed Toronto Dominion Center. Ravel, his vision did not just include a building, however. He always wanted to commission a sculpture in order to accompany the building, and he always wanted to accompany a sculpture by Henry Moore. He first voiced this desire in 1960, and he visited Moore in order to discuss different possibilities of a commission, but at that time in 1960, there were no funds. And as a result, the idea of commissioning a sculpture from Henry Moore was shelved. Ravel, however, was tenacious. And he returned to the idea in 1964, and he decided to visit a second time Henry Moore on November 23rd of that year in Hoglands, where Henry Moore lived with his wife, Arena. And he and Henry sat down, looked at the design of the new city hall, and they identified a sculpture that they felt would operate with the rhythms of the building. That sculpture was at that point a small-scale maquette entitled Working Model for Three-Way Piece Number Two Archer. What they felt is if they enlarged the archer, it would be a sculpture that would not simply supplement a building, but actually 
compete with the building for visual and spatial attention. Moore was never one to allow a sculptural commission to be dwarfed by architecture. Moore was, always very, Moore was always very critical of this. He always felt that sculpture shouldn't be a relief or decoration, but that sculpture should be its own autonomous entity in relationship with a building. But as you can imagine, a commission of this scale, especially in the 1960s, um, was complicated. Um, there was a art advisory committee for New City Hall, and they met on March 7th, 1966, to approve this proposal um, of Moore and, and Ravel. But unfortunately, the city council, they voted on March 16th, 1966, and they rejected it by a vote of 10-3. They simply did not want to invest the funds in a, an artistic commission, especially from a British artist. Many felt that if there were a commission, it should come from a Canadian artist. But the mayor at that time, Philip Givens, he was determined and he wanted this commission. He felt very strongly about this commission and he and other members of the community, particularly Mr. and Mrs. Claire Stewart, their sons, Tom and Mike and the McLean Foundation, they pulled together funds and they created a committee to fund this acquisition by subscription, meaning through private money. And so ultimately on May 7th, 1966, the archer became a subject of debate. You can imagine the mayor is supporting this acquisition. There are voices of dissent on city council and his opponent for the mayoral race that your controller William Dennison debated him in public about actually this sculpture. This became one of the many topics to be debated during the mayoral race. And Dennison was really of the position that the establishment shouldn't be imposing their will and their taste on the people of Toronto. But Givens really felt that importing a British sculptor by a major artist who was considered to be one of the most important sculptors of the 20th century would transform the city of Toronto, which he did call a quote, hick town, end quote, into a cosmopolitan center. So the debate occurred and many um, and then, you know, a few weeks later, a Canadian photographer decided to visit Henry Moore to let Henry Moore know, well, the mayoral candidates, they're debating the sculpture. It's the topic of polemics and controversy in Toronto. We really want this sculpture. It's too expensive. And Moore, after listening to the Canadian photographer, Roloff Benny, said, well, look, I'll reduce the price so I can make it easier for everyone to purchase. And we... And it was a special moment because it was at that point when Henry Moore wrote in a book that he gave to Roloff the following, which is why we entitled this lecture for Toronto. For Roloff, with admiration and thanks for today's discussion about the Archer for Toronto. And this statement that he wrote in his gift to Roloff, I think really encapsulates the spirit of generosity that really motivated not just the Henry Moore Sculpture Center, but the Archer, as well as large two forms. So on September 14, 1966, our city council finally accepted the gift of the archer by subscription by a vote of 19 to 1. It was October the following month, 27, 1966, where we had the grand ceremonial unveiling of the archer in Nathan Phillips Square. And as you can see in the photograph, it was quite the event. Some 10,000 people attended. Unfortunately, more was unable to attend. But oddly, even though Mayor Givens prevailed with the commission and in his ability with others to pull the funds to buy it and convince city council to vote to approve the commission, Mayor Givens lost his mayoral race. And he more actually really was impressed that there was a politician who was willing to lose office over a work of art. Moore did not see the sculpture in C2 during the unveiling, but he did in March 1967 when he visited Toronto for other purposes, which we'll discuss. But when he saw the Archer Nathan Phillips Square, he felt in retrospect that it was overwhelmed by the towering structure of um, Ravel City Hall. And in retrospect, Moore said that he would have made the sculpture larger so that it wouldn't have been crushed by its architectural surroundings. This is just the first episode in Henry Moore's engagement with Toronto. But what we can say about Henry Moore in Toronto that really Vilho Ravel, the architect of City Hall, he really introduced Moore to Toronto. And in many ways, the Henry Moore Sculpture Center that we have at our museum is really a product of the vision of Ravel. 
So here is a photograph taken October 15th, 1971. And what you see before you, this is the building committee of the phase one expansion of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And from left to right, we have Douglas Crashley, Ayala Zacks, Henry Moore, John C. Parkin. He is the architect sitting next to him with his hand on his chin, his former director, William J. Withrow. And at the end of the table with the sideburns and the glasses and the mustache is curator Alan G. Wilkinson. So the Henry Moore Sculpture Center at the Art Gallery of Ontario, many of you have visited. It is that wing um, that where we install the plasters and other works by Moore. Really, it is the result of a collaboration between the AGO, its trustees, its board, the artist Henry Moore, the art historian and curator Alan Wilkinson, and our Ontario provincial government. You can imagine that the negotiations that ultimately resulted in the erection of the Henry Moore Sculpture Center and the phase one expansion were quite elaborate, but I'm going to be brief in the interest of time and I'll make the long story short by focusing on two key meetings that resulted in the building of the first stage one expansion of the Art Gallery of Ontario. So the first important meeting was on March 15th, 1967. And this involved J. Allen Ross at AGO board pres and our AGO, former AGO board president, Sam Zacks and director William Withrow. And when Moore was in Toronto to see the Archer, but began discussing the potential plans of building a gallery for works of art by him, um, they asked him, Moore, if Moore would be willing to sell more works of art to Toronto. And they did this for a very specific reason. They felt that if they had a significant body of work by Henry Moore, it would be easier for the Art Gallery of Ontario to make an appeal to the provincial government for the funds to expand the museum. They felt that they, if they were able to show the provincial government what they could do with the expansion, that the probability of receiving those funds would be higher. Moore, of course, was open to this possibility, especially because at that point, the Tate in London, they were debating whether or not they would accept a gift from Moore. Moore obviously had sentimental reasons to give his works of art to Britain, but the Tate didn't know if they wanted to shoulder the cost of an expansion. And then there were other contemporary British artists, including Anthony Caro and others, who really felt that it was inappropriate for the Tate to invest so many funds in just one artist. So you can see that in Great Britain, this was a subject of debate. There was a lot of uncertainty. So Moore was happy to consider Toronto as a destination for his work. On December 9th of 1968, Moore wrote to Edmund Bovey, who was then a board member, and he articulated a firm commitment to ensure that a large and representative body of his work would be displayed at the AGO. And it was that letter that would enable Bovey and others to make an appeal to our provincial government. So in mid-1969, let's fast forward maybe five months, everyone's in London and they all met at the Tower Restaurant in London. And there was the Honorable John Robarts, who was our former premier of the province of Ontario, with his wife, Nora, and the AGO president, Ed Bovey, his wife, Peg, Sam and Ayala Zach, John Park and the architect, with Moore to discuss the new center. And it was at that meeting when the former premier, John Robarts, really agreed to commit $12.5 million to the Art Gallery of Ontario in order for us to realize our first stage of expansion. And that was approved by the government in, on November 6, 1970. So before you, we have a architectural plan. And so here you see in the center, that was the original footprint of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And right here, where you see my cursor, this area of dark gray was the phase one expansion that includes the Henry Moore Center. Do you see here the Ayala, Sam and Ayala's X Pavilion where we have our special exhibitions and then the entire wing right now where we have our historical Canadian work from the Thompson Collection. It was a significant expansion. And this phase one um, expansion just to give you a sense of how transformative it was for the museum. Here you have the um, surrounding city grid of the Art Gallery of Ontario. It was a huge expansive. It was a transformative. But I also show you this particular site plan because I want to direct your attention to the intersection of Dundas and McCall. And in order to mark this expansion, there was always a plan to place a Henry Moore bronze at the intersection of Dundas and McCall. Now, this 
a decision to install large two forms at the intersection of Dundas and McCall was really the product of a conversation between a curator, Alan Wilkinson, this dashing man with his pipe and his spectacles, and Henry Moore, who you see gesturing to his left. And Moore determined in the late 1960s during various conversations he was having with Wilkinson that large two forms would be ideal for the intersection. And Moore was at that point um, enlarging large two forms. So it could be a monumental bronze that could be cast into an addition. Alan Wilkinson was coincidentally writing his master's, his MPhil, and his PhD at the Courtauld on Moore, the first time a student at the Courtauld ever wrote um, a master's paper, let alone a dissertation on a living artist. And it was through the personal relationship that he had with Moore that he was able to have Moore commit to installing large two forms at this intersection, but also to sell the sculpture to the AGO at a discount, in other words, at the price of casting. So here in this photograph, this is May 1974, when Moore traveled with his daughter, Mary, who you see standing between Wilkinson and Moore. And there they are directing the crane um, as they're citing the placement of large two forms at the intersection of Dundas and McCall. As you can see in this photograph, it was placed on a plinth and Moore was very obsessed with all details involving the installation of his sculptures. And so the plinth itself was made up of a particular mortar and a particular ballast. Um, and we'll describe why this is important later. But Moore was present for its sighting um, at the intersection of Dundas and McCall, but he was far from happy with the installation. And he was concerned that it was located at a busy intersection um, but he was willing to install it at a busy intersection because he realized that it would highlight the visually separate architectural identity of the new sculpture center dedicated to him. And behind you, you see the facade of the phase one expansion um, designed by the architect um, Parkin. Now, when you look at these two sculptures, the archer and large two forms, they could not be more different. When you look at the archer, the archer, it's a monolith, it's elevated, it's inaccessible, but you look at large two forms, it's this inviting participatory sculpture, as you can see from this photograph from the late 1980s of children who are leaning against the sculpture. But when you look at the archer, you notice how its rhythmic curves mimic the curves of the two arcs that form our city hall. And you look at large two forms and its sensuous curves form a sculptural counterpoint to the very rigid rectilinear architecture against which it is silhouetted. Now, as many of you know from recent memory and as Stefan remembers, because this was already um, in the works when Stefan arrived as our new director, the Art Gallery of Ontario and the City of Toronto in 2017 engaged in our Grange Park revitalization project. And as part of that revitalization project, we decided to relocate large two forms from the intersection of Dundas and McCall to Grange Park. That occurred on June 3rd, 2017. Some of you were present. You might have remembered the dramatic procession of cars and trucks with Henry Moore's large two forms down Dundas Street, turning left on Beverly. And then you had the dramatic dropping of the two components onto its new plinth in Grange Park. It was, um, it, it was a, an effort that was really complicated and uh, many people were involved. Our sculpture conservator, Lisa Ellis, who works really closely with the Henry Moore Foundation, she was present in order to ensure that everything would go smoothly. We also had representatives from the Henry Moore Foundation to approve our siting decisions but also work with us on the production of its new plinth in Grange Park. And if you look at this photograph, you'll notice that circle of gray underneath the sculpture. What we did in coordination with the Henry Moore Foundation in order to honor Moore's vision, we worked with them to cite the ballast and mortar so we can recreate a base that was similar to the plinth that existed at the intersection of Dundas and McCall. So as you can see in this photograph, the sculpture is now happily situated in a green in Grange Park. And you can see just as it, just as um, at Dundas and McCall, the sculpture and its sensuous undulating curves do form a lovely counterpoint to the rectangle of our 
um, new contemporary tower designed by Frank Gehry, but also, and somewhat interestingly, the sensuous curves of the sculpture almost mimic the spiral staircase that extends from the fourth floor to the fifth floor of the new Gehry structure. Liberating large two forms from the busy, cramped intersection of McCall and Dundas also enables visitors, whether you're walking down Beverly, whether or not you're approaching the park from John Street, to see how this sculpture shifts in appearance and how the positive and negative spaces of the sculpture form different configurations because now you can make a wide berth around the sculpture and really experience it as a three-dimensional object, but a three-dimensional object that is meant to be viewed from afar. Also, placing it in Grange Park, it's situated against a screen of trees. And I show you this photograph because you can see how the biomorphic shapes of large two forms, I want you to compare the biomorphic shapes to that knob in the tree. Do you see the knob that's maybe five-eighths way, um, five-eighths five up this trunk of this tree, that, that protuberance? Um, and you can see when you juxtapose the tree with Henry Moore's sculpture, how the natural rhythms of forms in nature, how the pulsating rhythms of nature inform the biomorphism of Moore, but also even the texture of the bark and the subtle textures and um, the subtle textures one sees on the surface of the bronze. You can see how Moore's vitalism is inspired by nature. And so we were really excited to be able to place large two forms in Grange Park so that one can at least see the sources of Moore's biomorphism, but also the whole tradition of truth to materials from which Moore stemmed um, in the tradition of British sculpture. Citing the work in Grange Park really was inspired by the locations of Moore's other um, cast of large two forms. Here we are showing you a cast from um, the Henry Moore Foundation in um, in Muchatham in in Northern England. And here you can see it's situated on a green with an ample amount of space around it, so one can experience it in its entirety as a three dimensional object with shifting formal configurations. And then you have that lovely screen of trees against which it is silhouetted. Here is another cast, and you can see that similar to its new home in Grange Park, this cast, which is situated on the campus of the Bundeskanzleramt in Bonn, Germany, the federal chancellery, here it has a green, and you have ample space to experience it as a three-dimensional object, but the sculpture also serves as a lovely sensuous counterpoint to the architectural structure with which it is juxtaposed. Now, while time today does not permit us to discuss the Henry Moore Sculpture Center or his extraordinary gift of works of art to the Art Gallery of Ontario that we install in this center, because today we are focusing on his public sculpture, the sculpture that you can experience outdoors 24 hours a day, I do want to focus on Moore's generosity. Now, Moore in total throughout his life, but from 1971, through his death, he donated a total of 893 works to the Art Gallery of Ontario. We have a total of 942 works by the artist, making it the largest collection in any public collection in the world. But more being the generous one that, man that he was, who believed in Toronto and believed in a city that embraced his particular form of biomorphic abstraction, donated a total of 893 works, making it a significant and profound gift, and one that was frankly transformative for the museum, particularly its modern art area. Here I'm showing you a lithograph entitled Reclining Figure Interior Setting 2 of 1977. You might not be able to see this on the screen, but if you look at the lower left, what I want to direct your attention to is this inscription in the lower left for Toronto. Every print that Henry Moore made in the wake of 1974 he inscribed for Toronto on every single lithograph, every single etching, every work on paper he gave to the museum. And that for Toronto, to me as a curator who works with this collection, it recalls his inscription to Roloff when Roloff, the photographer, visited him and alerted him to the polemics around the archer and convinced Moore to lower the price of the archer so that he could afford it, so our city council could approve it. And here he writes for Toronto on every single work of paper that he made 
in the wake of the opening of the Henry Moore Sculpture Center. It's a testament to Moore's love of the city. It's a testament to the critical role that he played in shaping our city's collector's taste, um, our broader civic and artistic cultures, but also the Art Gallery of Ontario's commitment to the medium of sculpture. And in the wake of Moore's extraordinary gift in the 1980s, we had a Friends of Modern Sculpture group who purchased major works by Picasso and Giacometti. But even in the future, um, our museum is committed to the medium of sculpture. And we decided today that we would revisit Henry Moore's history in the city of Toronto because we also know that 2021 is the year of public sculpture. And perhaps Stefan could elaborate on that celebration. Um, but this is the conclusion of my um, very, very brief, um, but um, informative, hopefully, um, discussion of Henry Moore's history with the city of Toronto and all the personalities that made these two important commissions possible. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. And um, Stefan, if you happen to have any, I'm happy sure. to. Um, well, first of all, um, I got a note here that says great presentation. Thank you. And I agree with you. I love how much information you got out in a very quick way. Um, question is, are there any plans to put a new sculpture on the corner of Dundas and McCall? Um, well, I'm just a curator. I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> and this is the advantage of having your director with you. I'll allow Stefan to answer that question. Sure. So yes, there is. Um, we've been working and when you work with an artist, um, ideas are developed. We've been working with Brian Youngen, who's a sculpture, sculptor, Canadian Indigenous artist, um, who was the feature of a major exhibition that, uh, about a year ago. Um, public loved it. He's um, extraordinarily, um, particularly popular with our younger audiences. Um, everybody loves Brian Youngen's work. So we've worked with him on a major, major piece. Um, it's, we're, we're not yet talking about it, what exactly it is, but it's significant, and I think it'll quickly quickly become beloved. Um, Kenneth, quick question. When did you discover personally uh, Henry Moore and how did you um, fall in love with his work? Um, I discovered Henry Moore as a teenager in Hyde Park in Chicago on Ellis Avenue um, at, on the University of Chicago campus is his Adam. And of course, the University of Chicago managing Fermilab, which is an atomic spinner in the suburbs of Chicago surrounded by the Argonne National Laboratory. Um, Fermi being the great chemist who is really res responsible for much of our nuclear arms. Um, they, Henry Moore and the University of Chicago um, collaborated in order to install that sculpture on Ellis Street. And um, that was my first experience of Moore, um, in, I guess, outside of a textbook. Um, but what I will admit, um, coming to the Art Gallery of Ontario, and I think this is the case for every curator, the way I was trained in art history, um, I was trained that the only legitimate sculpture was Cuba sculpture. And anything after Cuba, um, and this was Clement Greenberg and his justification of artists such as Anthony Caro. So my advisors never taught me the British tradition of sculpture. And I always knew it existed. Um, I was always curious, it was never taught. And um, so for me, working at the Art Gallery of Ontario, I, um, it's, I've had to, let's just say, challenge a lot of the presuppositions that I absorbed um, from the people who train me as an art historian. And, and, and I think it's a healthy experience. And I think that's part of the pleasure of curatorial work is you work with collections um, the, on works of art that sometimes you didn't pay a lot of attention to, and now you're forced to. And then you're forced to actually fall in love with these things. And I have to say that I have really become a real advocate for um, vitalism, British vitalism, British sculpture, the direct, the tradition of direct carving. And it's a real joy to work in the Henry Moore Sculpture Center and be able to present not just his monumental plasters or his direct carvings or his small maquettes, or just to describe his sculptural process, but also install his drawings and his prints so that one can also compare the way an artist who's known for working in three dimensions works on a two dimensional plane. And I think, the real advantage of working with such a large body of work is I've been able to really immerse myself in Moore's practice and I feel I have an understanding of his work that I never would have gained in a graduate seminar. So um, somebody's asking, uh, first of all, uh, how involved was he in the casting of these? 
Um, he was very involved in the casting. Um, but for example, Large Two Forms, he went to Berlin with Alan Wilkinson to see it cast at the Foundry. And what's interesting, and this relates to our monumental plasters, Alan Wilkinson expressed some concern, meaning we have to ship these large plasters, these very fragile plasters across the Atlantic um, by boat and by rail. And you know they might become damaged. And they were in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin for the casting of large two forms. And he more pointed to a plaster from Egypt and said, well, look, if this plaster could look, survive 3,000 years, I'm sure my plasters will be just fine. Exactly. Um, but yes, he was heavily involved in the casting of his works. Right. Right now with Brian, the work is in Walla Walla, Washington. And there's been a whole, you know, getting to know um, the, the foundry and getting to know the people who are actually casting it is key. It's, it's, um, cause you're, you're, the artist is giving their work to be transformed into a new medium. So, um, it's a pretty exciting process and a very, very expensive process, but we'll be coming to the public later for the help of, uh, the Brian Youngin. Um, one of the things I love about Henry Moore is the degree in which the public's embraced it. When I arrived here, um, we do something called net promoter score, which means we interview do exit interviews. How are we doing? Are you liking it? And the net promoter score is basically how many people had a great time at the AGO. And there was one week where the, the net promoter score crashed. And I was like, what's going on? Like, like, and what it was, was we were doing some work in the Henry Moore Gallery and the gallery was closed. So we often just kind of, because it's here, we take it for granted. But the moment we close it, um, the net promoter score of our visitor falls dramatically. So it's, it's actually a key part to, to the visitor's experience here. And um, I love that the next generation um, will discover Henry Moore in Grange Park. And one of the questions is, you know, may I sit on it? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, you know, don't scratch it, but you're more than happy to, to climb on it and uh, have fun with it. It's, it's, I think, one of the things that makes it alive. Um, that's key. So, any final words, Kenneth? Um, no, except, um, you know, as, as we mentioned in this lecture, the Henry Moore Sculpture Center, and this was really under the leadership of um, Bill Withrow and Alan Wilkinson, it really helped the art gallery in the 1980s distinguish itself as a center for the study of sculpture. And within our holdings, we have, especially in the 1960s, um, we have significant holdings of major American sculptures. We have major works by Anthony Caro. But we also have important early Picasso and early Matisse sculptures. And, and, I, and this was a deliberate decision, I think. And um, many of us know that just two hours away is the city of Buffalo, New York, where you have the Albright Knox, where the, um, where the um, pillars of society in that city were able to amass a phenomenal collection of paintings. And, and I, I, I do believe that our board, our former director, um, Bill Rithrow and Wilkinson, who was really hired to be the curator of the Henry Moore Sculpture Center and then became the curator of modern sculpture, I think they saw the opportunity to invest in sculpture as a medium in order to distinguish this museum yes. from its sister institutions. And it's a legacy I embrace. Installing sculpture is very different than Stallings painting. It's a very different type of spatial investment. It's a very different type of experience. It's a very different form of thinking. Um, but you can even see in our building, our galleries, for example, Sydney Eaton Gallery, it's built for sculpture, yeah. just as the Henry Moore Center is built for sculpture. And I think it's great that our next major commission will be a sculpture and, and that we're continuing this legacy that really you know, was inaugurated by an architect from Finland um, in 1958. And, um, and I hope it's a legacy that um, we continue to cultivate. I, I hope so too. And I think there's certainly an, an audience for it. So I wanna thank everybody for uh, joining. I wanna thank Kenneth very much. Um, Kenneth was going to be opening in a couple of weeks a Picasso show. Um, it's been delayed because of COVID, but we are working with all the partners and we will have it here in Toronto. It's, it's still on track, but it's just going to be a bit late. Um, please join us again at ago.ca. Um, this, this Thursday, I'll be speaking to Rand Suffolk, who's the director of the High Art Museum Atlanta. Um, Atlanta is a, a really amazing city with a rich history, but also um, a, a history that there's a lot of tension 
in Atlanta. So I'm looking forward to chatting with him. Join us um, every Friday. I'm speaking to um, a different, or every Thursday, I'm speaking to a different director. The following week, I'll be talking to the director from Kalamazoo, Belinda Tate. And after that, I'll be talking to Maria Balchal, who's the director of the Tate in London. So um, that'll be a, a good chance to kind of um, chat with her a bit. And I should say that um, this coming Tuesday, Adam Levine, who's our new curator um, of European art, will be uh, doing a presentation. So please join us on Tuesday of next week at five o'clock. You can always go to AGOCA. The team here at the AGO is producing extraordinary content for all of you um, to enjoy. And I'm thrilled at the number of people who are signing up and watching. So thank you very much. And thank you, Kenneth. Enjoy the evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you for joining Bye -bye. us. Bye -bye.